Hey everyone, welcome to today's uh, webinar from Times, Times 101. Um, we're gonna run through a slide presentation and then we're gonna dive into a, a simple but very powerful story that we can uh, share out after the fact on analyzing bulk IP addresses and then outputting that uh, through an email as a CSV file, as well as creating a ticket directly in JIRA. So for anyone that's not familiar, uh, Times is a powerful automation tool made uh, simple, really kind of allowing our users to focus more on automation rather than uh, working in many different tools, writing custom scripts, and really allowing users to take advantage of automation within their organization. The top three challenges um, that we find within the market and really kind of the genesis of why Times was, was created was really the burden that's on security and IT teams today, whether it's too much work, not enough staff, or uh, ultimately the inevitable incidents. Around too much work, we're finding that around 83% of security teams, they're overwhelmed not only by the volume of alerts that are being generated, but also by a lot of the complexity uh, of the tools that they have in place today, and certainly a number of high false positives uh, along the way as those alerts get generated. As you would expect, uh, not enough staff. It's obviously very uh, difficult to find and not only attract, but retain uh, very talented staff. And then with staff churn, uh, you know, with that becomes a lot of unfulfilled workloads or automations from uh, some of the, the traditional providers where you have to write custom code and, and do things that, that a lot of folks aren't familiar with. And then on top of that, with too much work and not enough staff, inevitably there's always gonna be an incident. And it's really around how we approach automation that allows our users to react, remediate and triage those inevitable incidents and helping to uh, ultimately lower the cost per breach, but also give them uh, a consistent repeatable process at scale that allows their, their staff and employees to react and again, remediate those incidents that, that may occur. And with Tynes, uh, really what we provide is a, a very radically different approach to automation, which allows both IT and security teams to automate any workflow, uh, regardless of the complexity of that. And that's exactly what we'll dive into today as we run through and, and build out our story. So Times was founded uh, by Owen Hinchy, and then soon after uh, he brought on Thomas Kinsella. So both of them are our co-founders, Owen's our CEO and Thomas is our COO. Previously, they had a lot of experience um, as operators uh, running uh, security teams at DocuSign, eBay, and PayPal. And that's uh, kind of the foundation of the, the Times uh, organization is Owen and Thomas utilizing their expertise within the industry and really you know, finding and building a team that uh, focuses primarily on customers, but again, providing that uh, simple automation made simple for our organizations that, that we support and our customers. So based on you know, our competitors in the market and what we see, uh, again, a lot of kind of what is going on from a traditional SOAR perspective is a lot of those tools are not only rigid and complex, but they're very bloated as far as the features and functionalities that they provide and not really good at one particular thing. They try to be generalists in multiple areas and not really focus and double down on uh, the automation aspect, which is truly the, the foundation of a sort of platform. So with that, um, you know, the pre-built integrations, they're not only restrictive, but they're not easy to customize. The complexity adds uh, a ton of time to not only engineering resources, but also you need to go and find specific SDKs build custom integrations, and then that learning curve becomes extremely steep, especially if you don't have that development background. And again, with the bloated aspect, we're pro they're providing uh, automation, threat intelligence, case management, chat solutions, and number of things a part of that source solution. And not only does uh, most organizations not get full value from all of those features, but they're also very expensive uh, for features that you may not be utilizing where you have something already that's best in breed, like a Slack, a Zoom, Jira, ServiceNow, whatever it might be in those um, specific tools in the industry. So Tynes is laser focused solely on automation. And again, we'll see that as we dive into the demo today and start to build out a, a very simple but powerful story uh, that you all can make use of. And really, if we focus on you know, why Tynes is, is so productive within the, the market and, and how we win, uh, really it's around our powerful, flexible automation uh, making it accessible to anybody that um, needs to utilize uh, automation, whether they're an intern, a uh, new you know, entry-level analyst, or if they have many, many years of coding uh, and development experience, anybody that has access to time, times, they can easily get uh, onboarded, 
make use of the automation, and then always uh, have the opportunity to iterate and add to that automation in a very simple and effective way. Here's a, a kind of snapshot of our current customer base as it stands today. Obviously very proud of these customers and, and very uh, thankful to be working with them and uh, hopefully adding to this uh, even more as we end 2021 and move more into 2022. And if we take a look at some of the leading use cases that Tynes um, kind of tackles within the market, this list is certainly not uh, exhaustive, but it's a, a good snapshot of what we see traditionally during proof of concepts and trials and as we onboard our customers and then what our customers are taking advantage of. So your traditional phishing response, threat intel enrichment, but also focusing on employee onboarding and offboarding, chat bots, and then processing software requests for approvals and provisioning uh, of new hardware and infrastructure, uh, either in the cloud or uh, in traditional data centers. So with that kind of entry uh, through the, the different slides, uh, with that, we'll dive directly into the platform itself and uh, start to build out a, a very simple story. So here, if I go into uh, my Tynes account, I have the ability to take a look at um, some of the items that I've already uh, built uh, within my dashboard. And really, the, the dashboard provides a high-level roll-up of your most active stories, your active actions, as well as actions used in events. And all of this we'll, we'll dive into along the way. Once you go to Tynes.com and you sign up for our free community edition, which is free forever, up to three public uh, published stories, you'll be able to immediately take advantage of the Times platform, the automation that we provide, and then certainly the, the story that we're gonna build out today. From there, I always recommend our customers go into their team that's immediately given to them. So if you sign up for Times today, you'll have something like your first team that's in there. And the reason that I point this out is in order to get started, and if we think of you know what that quote unquote heavy lift is or where we're gonna spend a lot of our time, a lot of it is really driven by the credentials and the tools that we're going to be using within the solution today. So to add a credential, we can go through, click add new credential. From here, we can give this a name. So if I want to say API void, which is one of the tools that we'll be using today for 101 webinar, I can go ahead, provide that name. I can capture my API key. And then from here, I can go ahead and select my uh, type as text, paste that value into the box. And then from there, I can define access controls on who has the ability to utilize this credential as we're building in the story. We can immediately segment it and only make it available to our Boston sales engineering team, or we can go ahead and make it available to everybody, which I'm going to do in this particular case. The Times uh, Credential Vault is extremely secure. It's uh, encrypted. Uh, it's AES-256 encrypted in Galway counter mode. If you have your own vault, like HashiVault or some key management store that you want to utilize in lieu of the Times Credential, certainly fine. There's ways that we can go ahead and connect into those and then still utilize those um, either uh, API keys, auth flows, AWS credentials, whatever it might be. And again, just make it that much uh, easier for you to get up and running. And more importantly, have times fit within your process and not have you fit within the times process. So once I go ahead and add in the appropriate information, I can go ahead and save this credential. From here, we'll see the credential has been saved. And if I type in API void, we'll see immediately I have that credential available uh, and, and already saved within my, my resource or credentials uh, section. From there, I always, again, recommend going and setting up your resources. To, so think of this as more like your times uh, or your domains for tools that you're working with, usernames. The most, most important piece of this item is just making sure that we're not uh, exposing potentially sensitive information to the story or to the users building within that story and really utilizing either the uh, resources or the credentials variable uh, and then uh, making sure that that information is removed from the storyboard. Uh, so we're not potentially sent, uh, sharing some sensitive information. Once we have our credentials and our resources added, from there, uh, we can definitely go into stories. I have a number of stories already pre-built. Um, so anything that you might be looking for after this uh, presentation, more than happy to, to share that out. Or if you have any questions, feel free to, again, go to times.com and interact uh, with our team on intercom. So to create our, our first story, we'll go ahead and click new story. And we'll go ahead and rename this one Times 101 Webinar by P-Checks. And you'll notice that we have a, a blank canvas essentially to, to work off of. 
And this is really how our, our users interact with the Times platform and start to build in automation for any of the workflows or, or processes that they have uh, internally. You'll notice on the right hand side, you have the ability to store and uh, save events for some period of time. We'll dive into exactly what events are, but for uh, for the sake of this, it's really just structured JSON being passed from one action to the next. And those actions can be found in the top left-hand corner. And it's only these seven foundational actions that we uh, provide our users to, to utilize as they're building automations. And it's really our core belief that with these seven actions, you can automate any workflow or any process that you have within your organization today. Simply select, drag, and drop your action onto the storyboard. So for this action, I'll go ahead and name this my form receiver. And forms is going to be one of the, the features that we use within today's uh, story. From here, once I uh, drag this action onto the storyboard, I can immediately navigate down to options, see what else is available to me. So in here, I do want to allow for uh, get and post uh, methods for the verbs themselves. And everything else I can leave as is with the path in the secret. But if we ever needed to customize this path, we have the ability to do so. So if you want to identify the webhook actions within times with specific tools, you'll have the ability to do that. On top of that, the other kind of more important actions around webhook is also the IMAP and the HTTP request action. And these three actions here will allow you to kick off a story within times, really kind of think of them as your entry actions. Again, the webhook, we have a number of different ways, whether it's receiving events from third-party tools that you have within your stack, utilizing the form, which we'll dive into and start to configure, or if you have chat bots uh, through Microsoft Teams or Slack, this is also another good way to initiate and trigger a story or a workflow. The IMAP action, more commonly than not, this is always utilized within our phishing response uh, examples and demos that we provide. So another good way to, um, to, to start that process and, and automate that workflow. If you have Google or Microsoft Teams, you can utilize any of our pre-built templates down here. And then from that point, as you enter that information into the search filter, you'll see immediately the public templates that are exposed. And unlike this HTTP action we have here, where there's some sample information provided down here in the builder, as well as the URL just being this Tynes account uh, URL, the HTTP request actions in the private templates are already pre-configured at a minimum to make a successful request. You'll notice immediately the only information our users ever have to worry about identifying and uh, providing is again, those credential and resource variables. So from here, I can add in my Google credential, and then further on, I can uh, add in a specific user or reference a value within the JSON path to do that dynamically for me. So now that we have our uh, initial action on the storyboard, again, which is this form receiver webhook action, what I'm going to do is utilize, again, one of the forms um, that Tynes provides to start to build out a workflow that allows either my SOC analysts, my uh, security engineers to uh, provide a, a simple and streamlined process to do bulk IP checks. So if I come up and we take a look at the available buttons up here in the top left, I can click on form. And then I'll be provided this interface where I can start to go through and customize exactly what I want the name of this to be. So we'll say IP bulk analysis. I won't provide a description. And then one of the more important pieces is always defining the receiving action. For forms, webhook is the only action that's allowed to interact and receive events from the form itself. So we'll select form receiver and we'll immediately see that now we can uh, utilize and, and click this submit button if we need to. From here, I want to provide some uh, areas for our users to input information. So I'm going to go ahead and add in some fields here. And we have a number of different types, short text, long text, uh, more importantly, file uploads. You have uh, specific date formatted fields, URL fields, and email fields. For the first one, I'm going to go ahead and select long text. I'm going to add in a name. So I'll call this my IP list. And I do want to make it required. And then as part of this, I want to provide a description for any of the users that are uh, making use of this form and uh, let them know that they can just simply paste comma separated IPs into this field. And I'm also going to make it required because this is one of the fields that we absolutely need to have data of uh, within for us to start to work throughout the story. 
as soon as I make that uh, update, we'll immediately see that referenced on the, the form itself. I'll go ahead and add in another field as well. And I want to receive emails on the results that I get. And I'm also going to make this uh, required. And again, this is a specific field that requires uh, email configured um, inputs. So if we did something like this and we tried the tab off of it, we'll immediately identify that this is not a, a correct email. We need to have at least an at in there. So when I go ahead and do at kdavis at times.io, we immediately uh, see that uh, error removed because this is a valid uh, email address. And for now, I'll just uh, input one IP address into this field here, and we'll start to submit. And when we go back to our story, we'll notice immediately on this webhook that we have an event. And again, the action event architecture within Tynes, it's really quite simple. Each action that's on the storyboard will receive an event. And then from there, that action will uh, send down a subsequent action to the follow on uh, actions within the story. So if I wanted to use the information from this webhook action, I can drill into my events, click show, and then start to see the information that was provided from that form that we, we just created. Now, if I wanna utilize this, which we definitely do in this example, on these IPs to run different checks across third-party tools, as well as reference the user that provided the email and send them the results, we can go ahead and start to add to this story by pulling in our event transform action. So if I go ahead and drag this onto our story, go back to build. From here, I have the opportunity to work with multiple different modes. So if I wanted to extract the IP or the IPs as part of that webhook action, I can select this one here. If we have deduplication around alerting or delay mechanisms on alerts or re-notifications, those are additional modes. And then we're also gonna work with explode and implode uh, that when we get to that point, I'll, I'll dive into a little bit more of what those uh, specific modes do. So from here, once we identify that we do wanna utilize the extract mode to parse out those IP addresses that are being sent in via the form, we we'll want to immediately identify the path that we're working with, construct the regex to parse out that IP, and then from there, uh, put those values into a new field. Again, utilizing the public templates that we have, which is about 2,400 at this point, we don't need to actually write or, or build the regex ourselves. We can just simply utilize those public templates by type in extract, go to uh, internal. From here, I can take a look at my extract IP addresses using regex. As you'll see, we already have that regex configured for us in the fields that we're gonna be putting um, or the field that we're gonna be putting those values into. So I can go ahead and remove this event transform action here, drag this one up, and then I'll connect my webhook directly to this event transform action. And it's really the event transform actions that allow you to manipulate and modify the incoming JSON payload from the upstream action. So from here, uh, what I'll do is I'll define my JSON path to pull out and parse that IP address. And this is really kind of what our customers do when they're building within Tynes. Again, there's no code, there's no scripts that need to be written. All you're ever doing is defining that path and then we will analyze the values or value within that field and then allow you to utilize that information downstream for enrichment, context, notifications, so on and so forth. So if I go ahead and remove that and input two curly braces in a period, we'll immediately see I can uh, define and call those resources, credentials, any story information. So if I wanna use outputs from this story as an input to another story to search a SIM, analyze headers, query uh, domains that are part of a phishing email, I can do that directly here. But for this one in particular, I'm just gonna go ahead and utilize my form receiver, input another period, we'll select our body. And then we already know the IP list from the form uh, field name that we defined. And I'll go ahead and select that. Where we already have that pre-built regex uh, available to us, I always recommend building and testing along the way. And what that means is once we have this uh, webhook action connected to the event transform, we have our JSON path defined and we have that regex available to us. I can go ahead and click dry run, select my most recent event. Once I click dry run, I can see immediately whether or not we parse that IP and how well that regex that we applied was able to extract the values that we're looking for. So far, this looks good. 
But we do notice that uh, this value here is uh, within an array. So if we have multiple IPs, instead of having to figure out another regex or a way to extract that information out to be utilized in API void where we captured our API key, what we have the opportunity to do is utilize that explode mode. So if I go ahead and drag that event transform action on again, I can go ahead and change this and I'll give it a very descriptive name, explode IPs. And again, that mode that we're gonna use is gonna be explode because we wanna treat those values within the array as its own independent JSON object. So from here, once I select explode, again, I'll wanna connect my extract IPs uh, regex action to the explode IPs action. And from here, it's the same process. All we'll have to do is define that JSON path. And then from there, again, you'll notice I have my upstream actions, form receiver and extract IPs. So I'll go ahead and select that. And then from there, I configured the field to be IPs. So I'll add that in. And then the two field where I'm gonna put all of these new values uh, into, I'm gonna change this from individual item to individual IP. And again, I have the ability to dry run, or if I wanted to test both the extract and the explode IPs, I can simply go into my webhook action, click on events and re-emit this event and essentially run it from that point in time down to the remaining actions. And another way to not only test, but validate that what we're building is not only going to work, but when we have the full story configured, we're not having to identify and understand where we went wrong within our configuration. So if I go ahead and click re-emit here, we'll see we have a new event. And then more importantly, we have those events passed from the form receiver webhook action down to the extract IP, in the explode IP event transform. By drilling into this uh, event here, I can see not only the value that I selected or the action that I selected, but all of the upstream actions as well. And this again becomes very important as we're looking to utilize or reference JSON information from the previous actions to provide again, context, dates, any other information that's in here. If we have certain requests that requires uh, an authentication token, a session ID, more commonly than not, that always lives within a header. So we can always reference that information should we ever need to. So now that I have my explode IPs working, I have that new field that I'm providing data to. Now it's time to work with our API void action and actually do some analysis on that IP. Again, if I utilize my public templates, I can go ahead and check IP reputation select API void, drag and drop that onto the storyboard, and again, connect that up. And you'll notice this iterative process that's always the same. Select an action, understand what we wanna do, drag that action onto the storyboard, ensure that we have the proper configuration for our endpoint. If we needed to, we could reference that resource for the specific uh, domain name that we're looking for. Down here, we have our credential. So if I go ahead and remove this here, Again, same process, two curly braces a period, dot credential. And then at that point, I can reference my API void 101 webinar key. And then for the IPs that I wanna analyze, same concept, we go ahead, add in our beginning logic, select the field and action that we want. And now I can go ahead and select the individual IP that I wanna analyze. Once I hit enter, again, I can dry run and test this, select my event. And then from here, we'll receive whatever information is given back to us by API void. Immediately, we can see we have a successful request. That's always what we're looking for when we configure credentials. And then at that point, we can see what API void is presenting back to us. Uh, we have something around our credits that remain, but more importantly, that data that we're looking for from the report on that IP. We can see blacklists, how many detections there have been, scan time, detection rate, so on and so forth. And it's really this information here that we can utilize to provide that context to uh, users via email, Slack, Microsoft Teams, or even reference that and create JIRA tickets or ServiceNow tickets uh, with this information that, that we have in front of us. So from here, I'll start to add in uh, some additional uh, steps. So now that we've exploded our IPs, now we wanna go ahead and implode all of those IPs. 
So again, we'll drag that event transform action on. I'll go ahead and give this a very simple name, implode IPs. Make sure we change our mode from message only to implode. And then here, all I need to do is reference the GUID path and the size. So if I go ahead and reference my explode, I'll immediately have that GUID. And then I'll also have the ability to define that path as well. We have our size. If you hover over any of the little indicators within the, the actions themselves, you can understand and see exactly what each of these fields is referencing and, and what we're looking to implode on. So here it's looking for the unique GUID that was used during the explode. And then here for the size, it's looking at the number of events that we should implode on. And essentially this is just referencing the dynamic value that's available within the explode IPs action itself. So here we have our size and we have our GUID, so that way we can reference those independently. Instead of going through and, and testing and continuing to run through this, I'm gonna now add in some logic around what I wanna do with that information. Some folks like to, again, send this information into a ticketing tool, into a chat tool, but for us, I wanna generate a, a CSV file, which is one of the other kind of cool things you can do within Tines is, again, you don't need to write a custom script or, or use some third-party tool to do this. You just simply utilize the event transform action, which will again allow you to manipulate that incoming data and structure uh, your, your uh, events that are being sent through into a format, into a file, into a message that's going to be uh, consistent, repeatable, but also useful uh, as you're, you're building within this. And from here, you can see we've added five actions. We're already getting validation on the, the tools that we're working with and the information we're looking for. Now, when we get to this point, it's really just identifying what is our current process today, adding times into that process, and then identifying areas for optimization. So if I go ahead and utilize uh, another event transform action, I'm actually just going to go ahead and copy the action I already have to generate this CSV from a builder or prior building session. And from here, once I have that generate CSV event transform action, you'll notice the, the next mode we're using is message only. And this really mode allows you to, to build a digest, but also um, build results, really kind of build a, a logical representation of the data you're looking for and add whatever um, you know, information is useful from the API void check or any of the other systems that we're working with. But really what we're doing here is just identifying, we do wanna create a file, we wanna reference all of the information from the IP check. And then we're also using some additional logic called fours, uh, for loops, if statements. And here we're identifying that for IPs in the implode IP list, I want you to go ahead and identify all of the IPs that have been exploded individually, all of the information that's coming from the check reputation uh, API void request, and then from there, provide all of that in the relevant fields that we've created and we've referenced with, within this CSV format. So we have our IP, location city, location country, service provider, if there are any proxies, and then the number of detections that are a part of those IPs that we're making requests to API Void to get information for. So now that I have this information here, we'll go ahead, we'll re-emit this event. I just want to see if that's going to work for us what we're gonna see uh, from that. And then now we have those successful events. At that point, I can drill into my events, show, see what's been created and immediately see that we have our IP address. We have our location city. We have our location country, our service provider. If there's an, a proxy, it says false and how many detections, which we see is 18. And from here, once we generate that CSV, again, we can share that information in whatever manner we would like. Going back to the form itself, as you might remember, we provided the email field. So anybody that's submitting these um, will receive that uh, output directly to their inbox and they can do further analysis uh, on those IPs outside of what's provided from uh, the API void check repu reputation. So for that, I'm gonna go ahead and just capture this uh, email action in the top. 
drag and drop that onto my story. And from here, as you'll notice, I can customize again, any of these relevant actions. So I'm gonna go ahead and say, I wanna email my agent who's reporting these and doing some analysis on them. The recipient, I want this to be a dynamic value. So again, I'm just gonna represent or input the form receiver, but first to go ahead and connect my generate CSV. From here, once I input form receiver, we'll go to dot body dot email. And then at that point we can customize our subject. So we'll say this is our IP uh, analysis form. And then the body, we'll do something real simple where we just say C attached CSV sent from Tynes. And then as part of that, I wanna go ahead and add in a new field. And again, if we click on these, uh, this option down at the bottom, we can select any of the additional parameters. So I'm gonna go ahead and include an attachment. Uh, the file name, I'm just gonna go ahead and say this is report.csv. And then for the base64 encoded contents, all I'm gonna do is just reference the generate CSV action. CSV, I'm gonna do a pipe, and then I'm gonna utilize the liquid syntax that we have within the platform, which was built by Shopify to say base64 encode. And then from there, I'll be able to send off this email to the agent that submitted it, and then start to uh, review and understand on a larger scale, if we have 15, 20, 100 IPs that need to be analyzed, no longer do we need to spend an hour or two or even you know, longer, depending on tasks and, and things that come up during the day to work on and, and try to identify what's going on with these IPs that are hitting uh, our network. So once I have all of this information provided, I'll go ahead back into my form. And from here, I'm gonna provide a, a larger list of IP addresses. So if I go ahead and paste these in, they're all comma separated. I'll input my email address. And from here, I can go ahead and hit enter. I go back into my story. We'll see we've already received that event. We now have 17 events that have occurred within the check IP reputation. And you'll notice here we have four events, three events, but now we have 18 events within the explode IPs. Again, that's because we're taking that array from the extract IPs using regex, exploding that array to analyze those values individually. And then from there, uh, assigning those to the check IP reputation request and dynamically analyzing each one individually by referencing that JSON path. If I go into my events, we'll see that we have 17 or 16 uh, events that came through. And then we have that one event from the uh, original first request that we made when we were testing that out. And then finally, we have the email that was sent to the user that submitted it. If I go into my email, drag and drop this over here, we can see that we have the message that was sent. We have our subject. And more importantly, we have the CSV file that we can work with. Go ahead and open that. And now we have all the different values uh, and information, the fields that were we created, all put into this nice PD or CSV format that we can easily understand uh, what's going on, get information on what that location is, the city, country, again, that service provider, any proxies, and then how many detections are associated with that IP address. So this is a, a really good spot to, to kind of pause and, and take a look. We've built out a very simple process within about 15 minutes that allows us to uh, accurately identify IPs, get the information that we need on those from our third party tool, but more importantly, communicate that to one or many members of our team to understand exactly what's going on. But maybe email isn't the best process for us. Maybe this needs to be exposed or added for audit reasons into our ticketing tool, or we need to send out Slack notifications on this information. So even though we have this very simple story here, you always have the opportunity to iterate on the story itself. One of the, the newer features within the Times platform is versioning. 
So where I already have this story working, it's providing me the information I, I need, and it's also communicating that out to one or many members of our team. I wanna essentially save this state of the story and reference it whenever I need to. So if I click off anywhere on the storyboard that doesn't have an action, it'll again bring up this um, option uh, section here on the right-hand side where I can select how long I wanna store my events, provide a name, description, but that also gives me the opportunity to click this clock called story versions and add in a new version of this story. So I have that here today. We have seven actions. If I want to rename this, I can go ahead and do that. So I'm gonna call this V1 times webinar 101. From there, I can go ahead and clone this. I can export it. I certainly don't wanna delete it because I wanna utilize this story. And then if I ever made changes or modifications, which we'll see, uh, shortly, I can always preview this particular um, point in time story version and reference it and reload it and make use of it uh, as if no changes ever occurred. And we'll dive into that in, in just a few minutes. So now that, again, I have my story built, we're receiving information, I have a saved version of this story. Now our process has changed or there's been, you know, talks within a couple of our internal meetings that we need a better way to document um, you know, these IP addresses and not have them live in individual inboxes or a, a large shared inbox for the security team in particular. So what I wanna do now is go ahead and add in the ability to create a JIRA ticket. So with that, if we again think about our public templates that we have available to us, I can go ahead and capture and bring over my uh, JIRA issue to create that. And then from there, we wanna go ahead and load in uh, that CSV file as an attachment within the, um, within the JIRA ticket itself. So if I take a look at my public templates, type in create issue, that will immediately bring up Atlassian and all of the create and issue types that are available for those HTTP request actions. So now what I'll do is I'll select my create issue in JIRA. Again, this is already pre-configured for us, so we don't need to make uh, too many modifications. So I'll go ahead and connect my email action, and I can have a, a linear setup like we have here, or we can drag our email action off to the left and then have this create JIRA issue to the right of it, and then have both of these executed concurrently. So again, referencing my JIRA domain, we can ensure that that's correct. I'm hitting the right endpoint, my project name is not going to be IR. It's going to be demo. We do want to keep it as a task. I'm going to be the assignee. We can leave the priority as highest. And then from here, I want to go ahead, add in the summary. So we'll do uh, IP analysis. And then my description is going to just be something real simple. Um, output from API void and have that there. And then again, the last bit, just making sure we have the correct username, which we do, and then make sure we have the correct credential, which we do now. And then while I can go ahead and create this uh, issue directly in JIRA, not yet can I go ahead and, and provide that attachment from the CSV. I need to actually utilize the uh, attachment action for JIRA itself. So we'll go ahead and upload attachment to JIRA and drag that onto our story. We'll connect that up to our create issue. And then from here, we already know this JIRA domain is accurate, but we wanna reference the appropriate key as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and remove that. Reference create JIRA issue. And this is gonna be dot body dot key. The reason this didn't auto populate is because there is no event here. So if I wanted to go ahead and deselect that, and go ahead and re-emit this event. This will give me an event directly in JIRA. And then at that point, I can go ahead, either look at the events and see what that key and process looks like. So we have our demo key here, but more importantly, what we're gonna do is dynamically add this in. So I'll go back to my upload attachment, drag down that uh, connector right there to the upload attachment action. And then at this point we can see, is this gonna be correct? It is, but we'll start from the very beginning. We'll call it dot body, dot key, 
And again, we're hitting that correct endpoint. Content type, method, all that information is already pre-configured for us. I do need to update my credential. And now down here in the content section, we want to reference the contents of the CSV and also the file name. So if you remember when we generated the CSV um, over here, we reference CSV as the field name. So what I'm going to do is go ahead and call my action. And we gave it a name of report.csv. And then the contents, that's going to be our generate CSV action with that CSV field that has all of the information we're looking for. And because we want to make this available for users to actually read, we want to, instead of doing base64 encode, we want to do base64 decode. And that will give us the ability to review the contents within the CSV file directly in our JIRA ticket. So once we have our um, JSON path identified with the action name generate CSV, the field name .csv, we did a pipe base64 decode. We can go ahead and hit enter. We don't need to make any modifications uh, to the header. Uh, we're just using basic auth here with that JIRA username and demo. And now that we have that process built out, I can go ahead and either re-emit the original uh, event that had all of those values, or again, I can go ahead and submit that directly through the form again. So because I wanna see this run for the very first time with these new actions that we've added, still keeping in uh, account the email agent, because we do wanna still communicate all of that information to the user that submitted it, I'll go ahead and remove all of the events. Again, just select anywhere on the storyboard that doesn't have an action. Click on the ellipsis in the top right and then select delete events. If you have an action selected and you click that, you'll see create template or delete action. I certainly don't want to delete the action. Create templates we'll, we'll dive into in, in just a moment. So now that we have our story built, we have our original version. We have a new version that's also here. One of the cool things kind of, if you think of uh, Microsoft Word or Google uh, Docs, Times provides an autosave mechanism where as you're building within a story, you don't need to go and create a new version history every single time. Times will automatically uh, save this version for you, I believe, every five minutes. Um, and then from there, you don't have to worry about doing that process manually. Times already accounts for that and, and stores that, that version for you. Cool. So I'll go back into my form. And then from here, I want to uh, provide all of those IP addresses again. So I'll paste those in, comma separated, following the instructions that we provided. And I'll go ahead and add in my email address, hit enter. And then from here, we go back into our story. And you'll notice that we just had that upload attachment uh, action execute. But more importantly, we don't see any red bubbles on the storyboard, which would indicate a failed request. If you do see a red bubble and you see a failed request, you always have the opportunity to drill into the logs. The events will also have that information. And if you ever wanted to be proactive and monitor actions or stories, if you click into status, you have the ability to monitor independent actions. You can notify uh, yourself when there are no events. So if you at least expect one event per day, per hour, whatever it might be, you can customize that there. Simply select that box. It'll immediately change the toggle. And then we can input uh, an email address and more importantly, notify when an action fails. And I do want to receive notifications when we have failures. I'm going to change this email. Change this email to my times email. And now if this were to fail, I'll receive that notification immediately and I can have multiple recipients and uh, from there get those results should that occur. But now that we have that action uh, set up to create our JIRA issue, kind of broadcasting out exactly what's going on to a larger audience. So anybody has or needs um, visibility into these types of workflows, they can go directly into JIRA. They don't have to come into Tines or wait for somebody to forward an email off to them. So if I click into my events, take a look at my JIRA issue key. 
I can pull that up. Once I go into times, I can see not only do I have my ticket created with the information that I provided, but I have that attachment immediately available, very similar to the one that we just reviewed uh, within the email itself, which we'll have multiple emails for now. So I'll still receive that event. I can download it, I can preview it, have a mini uh, kind of preview right here. But more importantly, this information is the exact same information that we provided directly in our JIRA ticket. So everyone has access to it and can work on this ticket and not leave it up to one individual person or user or analyst to, to report that. From here, if we wanted to, we could add in additional logic and transitions to mark this as in progress or done. And subsequently, if we add in additional steps to check the reputation or um, context of those IPs that are hitting uh, our network, we don't need to simply use API void. We can use other things like abuse IPDB, pull that information, add that in as a comment. Virus total and URL scan are also very popular tools. And you'll notice here we have additional case management and ticketing systems that we can connect into. And it's really kind of the the thought process should be, if there's an open available API, Times can connect to it. So there, again, there's no custom integrations, custom scripts that need to be written uh, for you to work with any of the tools that you have. And then more importantly, if you don't see one of the actions that you need on this left-hand navigation window, it's not that Times doesn't support it. It's more than likely that we haven't come across it yet. Well, we have over 2,400 public templates available. We do run into cases where we don't provide or have a pre-built example for you. It's very easy to, to add those in. Uh, one of the ones I worked on recently was from Agari. So if I go to the Agari API docs, they do a really nice job of providing documentation. But within that documentation, they also give you the ability to copy specific curl commands and times allows you to take that curl command, paste it into your story, and we'll go ahead and format that request for you as is directly from that documentation. Again, understanding the fact that we need to update our credential and we can go ahead and call that. We'll add in this API as a placeholder. I don't have a, an Agari account, but really the purpose of this is to show you that if there isn't something that, that you need within the platform, always reach out to our team. We're more than happy to, to add these. That's how we've uh, added so many along with our community users and really kind of that constant feedback loop of the community and Tynes employees, uh, really you know, providing uh, the ability to utilize all of these templates. And once we have that uh, request formatted, I would certainly recommend changing the name. And then as we uh, remember from earlier, if we have an action selected and we click on that top right, we do have the ability to create a template. So from here, we'll go ahead and give this a name of Agari, Agari Alerts. Our request is already formatted. It's referencing the appropriate credential. Once I save that template, Agari API for our description, I can save that template. It'll live right here in my template section. If I go into my name and go into action templates, that's where I can reference that information. This is also where you can switch to dark mode. You can also add additional users. And if you have SSO uh, as part of your organization, and that's how you authenticate to apps, Times provides that out of the box for you. We don't believe in charging for security. Uh, you just make use of it. We, we recommend using SSO, uh, if not the Times uh, MFA authentication. So all of that's available in here for you, along with descriptive information on what's needed and what should be provided back in Times to successfully authenticate via SSO through Okta, OneLogin, what have you. So now that we've um, added our template, if I go back into my recent stories, we'll see immediately that's available here. And again, if I drag and drop that onto the storyboard, I already have all that information pre-configured for me. So for today, that's exactly what we want, wanted to run through. A very simple but effective story that's not only efficient, but provides us a consistent uh, and repeatable feedback loop. From here, we can certainly provide you know, a lot more uh, functionality. A lot of times uh, folks will ask, how do I repurpose or reutilize stories? Do I need to you know, 
copy and select all of these actions and paste them into an existing story. If we wanted to utilize the IP address information from this story to do further analysis, all we simply need to do is drag on that sent to story action. From here, we'll say uh, IP um, insight as a name. Again, we'll connect that up to our action. From here, we can go ahead and reference a story. And again, we'll wanna make sure we select anything on the storyboard that doesn't have an action. Enable our sent to story functionality. We need an entry action, which is gonna be our webhook, and our exit action, which is gonna be our generate CSV. And then from there, we can go ahead and reference any other story that we have built to do further analysis in IP addresses, uh, do some searches in our SIMs, and really kind of just repurpose stories that have already been built so we're not having to recreate multiple stories that do the same thing and really repurpose and use those across the Times platform. I really hope that you all enjoyed today's presentation. Again, I'm more than happy to share this story out. Uh, for us, it's just a matter of doing a simple export, and then this becomes a JSON file that you all can reutilize and import directly into your accounts. Everything in here is already formatted for us. And then as you add uh, this story into your platform, you'll notice the webhook information is going to change dynamically. So we're not going to be hitting my JSON or my webhook path in secret. It'll be your own unique uh, webhook and uh, all that that gets configured for you. And again, the only information that you'll be dependent on adding is your credentials for API Void or any other tool that you have um, in place. And again, if you want, you can just simply delete that action, swap it out. If you delete something inadvertently, you'll always have that toast that pops up to undo, or you can do a simple Command V, or yeah, Command Z, sorry, to undo that action. And then that'll be immediately replaced and put back into the story for you. And then from there, we have additional shortcuts. If we wanted to zoom in, zoom out, more importantly, scroll to start, we can click that and that'll bring us directly there. And then the last part is our annotations. Annotations are a great way to provide documentation along the way as you build, similar to testing and dry running uh, things. So in here, we could provide direct links, videos, descriptors, checklists. Most importantly, it's a good way to allow you to communicate internally in the stories on what certain areas or sections are doing. So new users that are coming in, that information isn't being lost. Uh, we have you know, everything that we're looking for, direct links, so on and so forth, um, and just providing kind of an additional way to understand what's going on and then have that information available to us so we understand exactly what this story is doing and why we had so much fun building it. I'll take a moment now, see if there are any uh, particular questions from the audience. And while I'm doing that, I'll go ahead and post a poll and we'll see uh, if anybody has uh, insight into automations that they have in place today and then what they're ultimately looking to, to automate. Looks like a couple questions came in. Uh, so I noticed you called a credential. If we don't wanna store credentials within times, how can we reuse the credentials that we already have today? Uh, yeah, great question. So we have the ability to utilize um, any of the, the vaults that you have. Um, most common ones are HashiVault or AWS. Uh, where we're utilizing the credentials from those solutions. It's very easy for us to connect to those tools. We have uh, a number of blog posts around that where we can go ahead and go to times.com slash blog. From here, you can type in uh, HashiVault or Vault. And then from there, start to uh, follow along within those instructions on things that you can utilize to build within Times. We have our quarterly contest, You Did What With Times, available too. So if you do sign up for the community edition, you have the opportunity to compete within that. And then from there, um, as I said, you can go to times.com, sign up for free, get your community edition. Uh, also book a demo if you'd like as well. 
And this leads us into our next question, which is pricing. So times follows a very simple process in how we price. So for us, the actions are what makes up a story and stories can either be published or unpublished. Published stories are what counts towards your licensing. So here, if we go to the times.com pricing section, we have all of that information available to us. Again, the community edition is always free up to three stories. You have one team and unlimited users. And then from here, we have our different plans that are available to you, which provide different story or different limits on the stories, 10, 25, or more than 50, as well as a number of different teams breakdowns. We always give unlimited seats, unlimited throughput, number of actions, number of events. We don't believe in nickel and diming in those areas. We just want people to build, automate, and more importantly, see value from their automation tool. With these, you do have different onboarding experiences. Uh, Pro is four weeks, Teams is eight weeks, and Enterprises is 12 weeks where you work with your account manager and customer success engineer um, to optimize, build, and, and really kind of um, iterate on all of the use cases that you have in place today. Doesn't look like there are any more questions. Uh, so I wanna thank everyone again for, for your time today. I really appreciate it. I do recommend you go and sign up for Community Edition, start building and automating with the Times platform. And as always, do not forget to add in your credentials and start uh, inputting those. So that way, when you're working with the different tools that you have within your stack, you're immediately seeing those successful 200s when those requests are made, and we're not having to worry about uh, different failures um, from misconfigured credentials or endpoints. We always wanna make sure we get that, that proper 200. Thanks again to, uh, for today, everyone, and I really look forward to talking to you soon. Have a great day.